This morning the reading comes from Matthew 6, verses 6 through 15, it's called The Message. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is so full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs <coughs> and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like you loving you, like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world to right. Do what's best as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You are in charge. You can do anything you want. You are blaze in beauty. Yes, yes. Yes. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. spiritual disciplines. Everybody say spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines. Right. And spiritual disciplines are practices that open us up to the presence of God so that we become more aware of what God is doing in, around, and through us. And so we've been looking at these spiritual disciplines, practices that can make you a better disciple for the last several weeks. And we're going to wrap that up today with two, two different disciplines. These two different disciplines are prayer and guidance. Prayer and and guidance. Now, they're very similar, so I want to uh, just give you a quick little statement to help split them up, give you some differentiation here. Prayer is speaking with God. Guidance is trusting Him to lead. Prayer is speaking with God. Guidance is trusting Him to lead. When I was in uh, school, grade school, uh, often during the summer I would go to Bible camp. How many people went to Bible camp, church camp? Yeah, okay. One of the things that we did at Bible Camp or Church Camp, and we also did some other after-school programs and things, was we memorized scripture a lot. How many people when you're growing up had to memorize scripture? Sunday school, Bible Camp. Yeah. One of the things that we had to memorize wasn't necessarily scripture, but it was a format, a, a template for prayer. Uh, this template was called the Acts. A-C-T-S. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. A-C-T-S, Acts. And it breaks down like this. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Let's all say it together. Adoration, Adoration confession, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. supplication. And these were just kind of uh, different types of prayers that you could pray. And so we would have to memorize these four things. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And then we'd get all sorts of points or stars or whatever. And then at the end of the week, we'd get prizes. And so it just kind of stuck with me. So then when I started teaching confirmation class last year, uh, I actually changed it around because to a junior higher, they don't use words like adoration or supplication, right? So you had to change it around a little bit. So I changed the acronym to LION, which essentially means, uh, I broke it down to mean love you, I'm sorry, oh help, or uh, oh thank you, excuse me, and supplication, need help, right? Love you, I'm sorry, oh thank you, need help, LION. Because uh, that's a little easier to remember. But I'm going to stick with adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, because you guys are big kids, and you're on target with things. And what I want to do is lay that over the Lord's Prayer. How many people notice that we do not say the Lord's Prayer this morning? Yeah, I figured. 
Don't worry, I haven't lost my mind. I did it on purpose, okay? I'm going to lay this format, this template, over the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, and uh, then we'll, we'll dive in there a little bit. So let me start off uh, with a little bit of prayer, and then we'll get into the rest of the sermon, okay? Here we go. Father, teach us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this morning we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, so if you have a Bible, I encourage you to go there. Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5. Matthew chapter 6. Starting with verse 5, it's not going to be on the screen. Um, and the reason why is because Jesus speaks a better word than I do. And so it, it's, it's one of those things where I like to just go back to the text uh, rather than just put stuff in uh, the whole time. So Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5. Uh, two weeks ago, I guess it is now, we talked about fasting. How many people remember talking about fasting? And basically the, the, the crux of that sermon was learning how to depend on God and recognizing our dependence on God. This morning, we're going to talk more specifically about how to talk with God and to listen to Him. How to talk with Him and listen to Him. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. And I'm going to read uh, verses 5 through 15, so I encourage you to follow along with me. Keep your finger there so you can go back to it. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth and as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So what I want to do is take this adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, lay it over this template that Jesus gave his disciples, and see all the different parts of this that are in the Lord's Prayer. Did you know that the Lord's Prayer is not necessarily meant to be said verbatim? Did you know that? It's, it's, Jesus says, this is how you should pray, not what you should pray. This is how you should pray. You should pray in this manner. Uh, and so it's more like guidelines. This is how you should pray. And another thing, just because I'm a Bible geek, if you'll notice, Jesus uses the phrase, and when you pray, twice. Right? Anytime there's repetition, you know as Bible study students, anytime there's repetition, you should pay attention to it. Right? Jesus is basically saying, this is an important thing to do. And when you pray, and oh, by the way, when you do this, I don't know if you've ever done that with your kids, but they have chores, and you say, make sure you take out the trash. And then a little bit later you say, and when you take out the trash, can you, mm -hmm. and then a little bit later you say, and when you take out the trash, can you, you know, it's kind of that subtle, okay, get on it, right? So here we go. The first thing that Jesus uses is, oh, is adoration. Tell God how much you love him. That's what adoration means. Tell God how much you love him. Uh, just lay it out for him. Tell him exactly how you feel. Some of us need to get in the practice of professing our love. Right? Fellas, I'm helping you out here, okay? This is a secret your wife may or may not have told you, okay? But she wants you to get in the practice of professing your love more often, okay? Not just to her, but also to God, right? You can never tell someone you love them too much. Everybody agree with that statement? Tell God how much you love him. And so Jesus starts his prayer like this. He says, Our Father. Now, I know we say this every single week, so we miss it. But this is a huge, huge deal. Because Jesus is telling his disciples and those who are listening to this sermon, he's telling them the rules have changed. You might, you might remember how the relationship was between God and the people in the Old Testament, right? 
uh, the people would have their problems, okay, and they would go to the temple or the tabernacle or the tent or whatever it was at the time. They would go up, they would talk to the priest, they would say, this is my problem, this is my sin, this is my issue, this is what I need you to talk to God for me about. The priest would say, okay, where, where did you, where's your sacrifice? And so they'd hand over a sacrifice, a goat or a lamb or a couple doves or something. He would go to the altar, kill it, blood spill. Then he'd go inside the, the tent and he'd go inside the inner room and he'd pray to God, God, these are the, the issues, the sins, the needs of the people. And there was really a, a bit of a disconnect between God and the people because God was understanding to be so incredibly big, so incredibly set apart from the rest of his creation. He was feared, and I mean that in the, in the most reverent way. He was feared, and so there was this little bit of separation. You'll remember when uh, Moses, how many people remember Moses? Yeah. Moses is leading the Israelites through the desert, and God comes down on the mountain, right? There's smoke, and there's thunder, and there's fire, and all sorts of stuff, and the people say, Moses, you go talk to God, because we don't want anything to do with that. Right? That's too scary. And even when Moses heard the, uh, God calling him to go save the Israelites, remember burning bush? Burning bush, give me some bobbleheads. Okay. Yeah, burning bush, yeah. Uh, Moses asked God, God, who do you want me to say sent me? Remember that? And God said, tell them I am. Right? I am who I am. That's God's name. And it was considered so holy, so sacred, so set apart and different that for a, a, several, several, several generations, the Jews wouldn't even write God's name down. That I am, that is the Hebrew word Yahweh, okay? They wouldn't even write it down because they considered it so holy. They wouldn't speak it, they wouldn't write it, they didn't even think about it, really. For generations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, okay? And even uh, some extremely uh, dedicated Jews today won't use the name of Yahweh. They just won't. Our Father, uh, the rules have changed. Jesus is saying, God has invited you into a more intimate relationship with Him. Right? There's still that reference, okay, He's God and you're not, but God has changed the rules in such a way that the, the curtain between you has been torn. Right? You have a new high priest, his name is Jesus. Uh, he is the sacrifice, he's the high priest, he's the mediator, he's the one that has the go-between. Things have changed, so you can call God Dad. And so this was a radical, revolutionary idea for the people at that time. Our Father. Uh, when I was growing up, junior high, I played basketball, if you can believe that. And uh, I was athletic at one point in my life. And uh, you guys were looking on me with pity. It's okay. <laughs> I played basketball, and uh, my favorite coach growing up was Coach Goodman. Uh, he was my seventh and eighth grade coach. And after I got out of eighth grade, I got to high school, and they shifted some coaches around. Coach Goodman needed an assistant coach. Okay, and I wasn't playing in, in high school, and so he, you know, kind of asked me, and I was sure I'd love to be the assistant coach. So in high school, I was the assistant coach for the junior high boys. It was awesome. I loved it. But it, as you can imagine, I went from being a player to being an assistant coach. And so Coach Goodman said, well, you can call me Randy. That's just weird, right? And even to this day, if you'll notice, I can't call him Randy. I have to call him Coach Goodman because that's how the relationship was established. And so even though our relationship had changed slightly, even though it had gained another layer, even though it was a bit deeper and a bit different now, uh, even though he extended that invitation, I still put up some hesitancy, some defense in calling him Randy. And I think we do the same sort of thing with God. We, we say, God, well, I learned back in the day, okay, you are God and I am not. And, and there's this big separation between us and I'm supposed to fear you and I'm supposed to revere you. And that's all, that's all well and good. But God has also extended this invitation to a closer, more intimate relationship. And he says, don't just call me Yahweh, call me Dead. And it's hard, right? It's hard. Everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. Cool. Moving on. Our Father in heaven, right? This is Jesus' reminder, he is still God, okay? 
You can call him dad, but he's still to have that reverent fear, okay? That respect. He is in heaven. He is different, okay? And elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus says he's different than your earthly fathers, right? God is, is all spirit. He is all-knowing. He is all everything. He is all. He's different. He's in heaven. He's set apart. He is still God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I got ahead of myself because, you know, I had this sermon for over a week and it happened. But that's okay. His name is sacred. Yahweh. Um, maybe you don't know this. The Hebrew alphabet, this is going to be a fun fact. I've been giving you a fun fact for a while, so if you're taking notes, draw a smiley face here. Fun fact, uh, the Hebrew alphabet has no vowels. Did you know that? Hebrew alphabet has no vowels. And so, if you look at the name Yahweh uh, in Scripture, if you look at the original Hebrew, okay, it's essentially Y-H-W-H. Uh, or in the Hebrew, it's uh, yod he vav he okay? It's four letters is God's name, and they're all constants. I told you, the Jews didn't actually write this down for a long, long, long time. Eventually, we got things like the printing press, right? You remember the printing press? And when they did some translating, because they had to go from Hebrew to, anybody know? The printing press? German, that girl. Uh, it had to go to German, right? And the Germans said, well, we can't read this. There are no vowels in it. So they plugged in their vowels based on some breathing marks and different things. And so they pronounced Yahweh's name as Yehovah. Does that sound familiar? And so Yahweh eventually became Jehovah. Okay. And so Yahweh, Jehovah, it's actually the same name. It's just different languages trying to plug in different vowels to pronounce the thing. Okay. Fun fact. See, you're learning German and Hebrew, all sorts of stuff. You guys are going to go home and put on Facebook. Man, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the awesome stuff we do at church. All right. So that's adoration. Jesus starts his prayer off with this kind of, God, I love you, and I respect you, and I recognize your place in the cosmos. Okay? Then he continues. Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? He continues with this idea of thanksgiving. Now, I tried really hard to define this, and I came up with, give thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't an English major. Uh, give thanks. It's God, thank you. Right? Adoration is God, I love you, you're amazing, you're awesome, you're fantastic. Then it's God, thank you. Thank you for this, thank you for that, thank you for this, thank you for that. Right? That's part of the reason why we have this praise and concerns time. Just, God, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. The interesting thing about gratitude is that it changes your heart and it opens your eyes. The week after Ash Wednesday, which is the 25th of February, we're going to start a new Bible study, a new small group study called 1,000 Gifts. And it's based off this book written by Ann Boskamp. And in that book, Ann talks about this challenge that she received from a friend to write down 1,000 things that God had blessed her with. 1,000 things. She said, well, that's impossible. I can't do that. That's too many. But she started. She started. And now, she has a running list that has well exceeded a thousand of the different things that God has blessed her with. Because as she began to write things down, she began to say thank you to God. Her eyes were opened to more things that God had blessed her with. Gratitude changes your heart, but it also opens your eyes. Jesus Continues And he says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Essentially, when you pray this, you're, you're asking God, be the king. Come and be the king. Be the Lord. Be the boss of my life. Be in charge. Be the ruling authority over everything. When you say your kingdom come, you're asking God to bring his kingdom, bring his authority, bring his rules, bring his reign, bring his sovereignty, bring it all, and be the king. That's what you're asking God to do. And not only that, but on the flip side of that relationship, you're saying, God, come and be the king. I am your subject. Right? Not just be the king, but I am your subject. I am uh, under you. You are Lord over me. 
twofold relationship here. Right? Your kingdom come. You guys know this. You know what? We leave your computer alone for just a little bit, and uh, things somehow get in here. I'm not sure what that's about. Anyway, uh, your will be done. I was rooting for the Seahawks, and my wife was rooting for the Patriots. I had a Seahawks slide in here last week, and the Patriots won. So then I had to go back and change it on the skin. Your will be done, right? You're, asking, you're saying to God, your will be done. Essentially, you're asking God, do what needs to be done, right? Do what needs to be done to accomplish your will. You guys can't dig yourself out. You had to have somebody come dig you out. And so you knew if you had errands to run or whatever, you were going to have to snow plow or dig your way out of your driveway. And there was no way to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish unless you dug yourself out of the driveway. Even though it was a lot of snow and your driveway is too long and the snowboard doesn't work right and it's too hard to lift a snow shovel and it's got a weird handle anyway, right? Even all that stuff, if you want your will to be done, you have to do certain things to accomplish your will. And so when you pray to God, your will will be done, you're saying, God, do what needs to be done. Finish what you started. Not my will, but thy will. My son Parker uh, is a pretty good sleeper, for the most part, um, but occasionally he'll wake up early. Uh, whether from a nap in the middle of the afternoon or from the evening and early morning, he'll wake up a little earlier than he should. And now that he's bigger, he'll stand in his crib and he'll yell, Ma! Ma! Right? Come get me. So sometimes we try to leave him in there. Other times he's persistent. Ma! Okay, all right, we'll come get you. So we go upstairs and get him, bring him downstairs, and he looks like this. His cheeks are all red and hair is all. And he's cranky for like the next hour. Why? Because he didn't stay in bed long enough, right? He needed to sleep a little bit longer. But in Parker's mind, it was time to get up. It was time to get rolling. He wanted somebody to come get him, even though mom and dad knew he needed to stay in bed a little longer. Sometimes we think we know what's best for our lives. We think we know what should happen. We think we have the best viewpoint on everything. And then when things don't go right, we get cranky. And we cry to God. Ah. God says you should stay to bed. I know what needs to happen for you. And so when you're praying, your will be done, thy will be done, you're saying to God, God, I trust your judgment. I trust your plan. I want you in charge. Jesus continues on. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Essentially, you're asking God to bring heaven to earth, to make earth look as it looks in heaven, to function as heaven functions. If you've read through the book of Revelation, how many people have read through the book of Revelation? Just tell me if you do. Revelation 21. Uh, you'll get to Revelation 21 where it talks about New Jerusalem, and it says heaven came down. The city came from heaven, right? So essentially, uh, at the end of time, it's not we all go up to heaven, but eventually heaven comes down to earth. Earth is made new. Earth becomes heaven. It's this kind of fusion between the physical and the spiritual. Now, some of you are thinking, what does that have to do with Thanksgiving? Right? What is this asking God to be in control and bring heaven to earth? And what does that have to do with giving thanks? Sometimes, I'm thankful that I'm not in control. When, uh, when I was growing up, I'd often spent a lot of, uh, most of my summers, uh, working with my dad. Uh, he was a truck driver, and so I would ride in the back of the truck, and dad was driving, and it didn't matter if there was a storm, didn't matter if there was a uh, lot of traffic, didn't matter any of that stuff. I knew I could just play in the back and be perfectly safe because I trusted dad to drive, right? Now that I'm older, dad won't let me ride in the truck with him anymore. <laughs> so, 
That's not true. You probably would. Uh, but when when we're traveling, my wife and I, right? Uh, you know, we're taking a long trip to Pennsylvania or doing whatever. I know I can trust Rachel's judgment, her ability to drive. And so I don't I don't sit in the front seat gripping the dashboard like. Right? I don't have to do that. I just I can kick back. I can relax. And she can do, she does the same with me. I trust her ability to take me where I need to go. Right? It's the same sort of thing. When you're giving thanks to God, sometimes it's, God, I'm so glad that I'm not driving. I'm glad that you've got things under control. I ask you to just keep on doing that. Because you know where we're going. You know where we're going. Everybody still awake? Yeah. Good, because I'm running a long water. <laughs> now, I realized I said I was going to do adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, and I did adoration, thanksgiving. Okay? Jesus didn't go in order, take it up with him. Okay? <laughs> Our next one that we're going to talk about is supplication. Right? This is the prayer that a lot of us give a lot of the time. Right? We leave out the other three parts and we stick with this. I need help. God, I'm sick. I need help. God, I lost my job. I need help. God, I can't find my keys. I need help. God, I can't find my kids. I need help. Right? <laughs> this is the prayer that we pray 90% of the time. And we forget about the other three. So this is the one we're most familiar with. I need help. And in Jesus format, his example prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we call it. He goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread. This goes back to Egypt. This goes back to the, the desert. Moses, the Israelites, right? You'll remember, they were wandering out in the desert and they say, Moses, we're hungry. And Moses said, alright, I'll talk to God. He talks to God and God says, alright, next morning, send them all out. There's going to be bread on the ground. So they go out. Right, it's like kids on Easter, right? There's just stuff all over the ground, and like, ah! you're gonna run all over gathering stuff. God said, no, just gather it up for one bucket. Okay, and they shove it all in, right? They called it manna. This is another fun fact, which in Hebrew means, what is it? <laughs> I think that's hilarious. So, if, if they gathered more, more than they needed for that day, it would go bad. And then come the weekend, because they weren't supposed to gather on the Sabbath, they would gather enough for two days and it would last. And so it kind of goes back to this idea of God providing just enough of what you need for that day. When Lou read the message translation, it read, it read, it read, God provided me three square meals, right? Give me what I need, what I need. It's hard, right, to just settle for what you need. God, give me what I need. Now, Jesus kind of blends supplication and confession together. So, we're going to talk about confession as well. Confession is, I'm sorry. Right? We talked about this as a spiritual discipline several weeks back. You might remember that. Uh, confessional and what that looks like. Confession is essentially admitting your mistakes, admitting your sins, your failures, your shortcomings. God, I'm sorry. Debts need to be paid. Broken places need patched. It's recognizing the places where things aren't quite right in our lives. Jesus continues on in this Lord's Prayer and says, Forgive us our sins as we forgive. Now in that statement, you're admitting you have sins. Right? Notice how the language has changed, by the way. Uh, the language has changed because in the first part of the Lord's Prayer, it was God you are, God this, God that. Then the language changes to all imperative verbs, which are verbs that demand action from the hero. And so, uh, give me my daily bread. Forgive me my sins. Uh, you'll, you'll see this again and again and again. Forgive us our sins as it's a big word. As. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Here's a question to think about. What would your spiritual ledger look like if God forgave you the way that you have forgiven other people? 
or maybe I could ask it this way, what would your spiritual look, ledger look like if God didn't forgive you the way that you haven't forgiven other people? That guy who cut you off, that person who let loose the off-color remark, that person who shortchanged you in business, that person who treated you badly in grade school, See, that's the funny thing about prayer. It's not talking to God. It's speaking to God, speaking to us. It's, it's a dialogue, an exchange. As we pray, God, forgive us, God is saying, have you forgiven? We say, God, give us what we need, and God says, are you content? It has this reciprocating effect as you pray that's not only... God, this is what I'm feeling, and this is what is going on, but also God, through His Spirit, is speaking to us and saying, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to think about. This is what needs to change. Have you thought about this? Jesus continues on. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This means, okay, that at some point we've been led. <laughs> We've been led. We need to be delivered. Right? We need to be rescued. When you say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, it's recognizing and admitting the fact that you are in dire straits, you are in trouble, and you need help, you need to be rescued, you need a savior. <coughs> lead us not into temptation, because we'll do that ourselves. We need to be rescued. And that's where it ends. That's where it ends. Where Jesus' format for prayer is. So now for the second half of the sermon. Now that you... <laughs> now that you know what you're saying every single week. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us... Our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now that you know what it is that you're saying, do you trust God with it? When you pray for your family, God, I pray for my kids, I pray for my parents, I pray for my brother, sister, aunt, uncle, grandkids. Do you then trust God with your family? When you pray for your finances, God, I need a job. God, I need, I need help paying the bills. God, I need help managing my money. I need help getting out of debt. Do you then trust God with your money? When you pray for your church, God, I pray that we grow. I pray that we thrive. I pray that we reach the lost. I pray that we help those who need help. I pray that we give hope to the hopeless and light to those in the dark. When you pray for all those things, do you then trust God with church. That's where guidance comes into these things. That's how it works. Let me tell you a story. When I was a kid growing up uh, in church, I would often sing specials with mom. Mom liked to sing in church, still does. And so when I was growing up, I also thought that was pretty cool. So then she would get me out there and I'd sing little specials as my cute little self, dimples and all. And uh, it was great. And then my brother came along. And, uh, oh, okay, sorry. My brother came along, he's three years younger than me. And uh, so he wanted to do the same thing that mom and big brother were doing, right? Because that's how little brothers are. They want to do whatever they see older brother doing. And so I remember the first special that we sang, the three of us all together, right? First special we sang, we get up there, and Spencer, he could hardly talk, okay? Let alone sing, okay? But he just kept, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, okay, all right, all right. So we get him up there, line all three of us up, and of course, he takes all the cuteness, because he just wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he gets, <laughs> forgive as you have been forgiven. <laughs> he gets up here, and uh, the, the funny thing is, right, he, he, he couldn't remember lyrics real well at that point, and, and he wasn't, you know, musically inclined, so to speak. Uh, but he really wanted to do it, he was excited, so we gave him a microphone. 
and didn't turn it on. <laughs> and so we're, the two of us are out there singing along, and we always videotaped our, our specials and stuff, so you can watch back on the video. The two of us are out there singing along, and Spencer is up there singing, and he's just going to town, man. He's just... But there's, there's one point in the, in the video, you'll notice he goes... Like, he's getting closer and closer to the mic. <laughs> Sometimes, we do the same thing to God. We say, God, here you go. Here's the mic to my life. Sing a song. Do something wonderful. Do something big. God, oh, it would be great if you did something like you did in the Old Testament. Whoa. But I'm not going to turn the mic on for you. I'm not going to give you any actual power over my life. I'm just going to hand it to you so you feel good. Now, on the flip side of that, my brother eventually did get handed a live mic. And he did learn about music. And he does incredible things. And eventually he became a worship pastor at a really large church who sings multiple songs and leads a congregation of hundreds of people on a Sunday morning through multiple services. All because we did give him a live mic. What could God do in your life if in your prayers, in your actions, in every breath that you take, you trusted him enough to let him sing? Let's pray. Father, I thank you all that you've blessed us with. God, you've allowed us the opportunity to speak to you. The one who, who breathed existence into everything. The one who gives us life. The one who gives us redemption. The one who rescues us. The one who forgives us. The one who showers us with grace and mercy. pray that we would give you power. We would give you authority. We would give you reign over our lives. And that we would enjoy the song that you're singing.